I want to start getting into the nuts and bolts of the viral infectious cycle. So today we're going to talk about, in general terms, what happens with, when a virus enters a cell. Remember, viruses need to get into the cells in order to reproduce. And we're, this is called the infectious cycle. That's what we call for what goes on in a cell when a virus gets in there. We're going to talk about how we study the infectious cycle, how we measure virus infectivity, and a few other assays that we use to study viruses. So that first slide shows you a picture of an infectious cycle. It's a cell, it's an infected cell, uh, and it shows viruses going through the different steps they need to do in order to multiply. So viruses have to attach to cells, they have to put their nucleic acid into the cell, and where they do that is either in the cytoplasm or the nucleus, depending on the virus. Depending on what virus is, you may have to make mRNA that is then translated into proteins. And then the virus has to make new proteins, has to assemble new particles by replicating the nucleic acid and then putting them together with the viral proteins. And these are the various steps of the infectious cycle that we study. We're going to actually go through this course looking at each of these steps. It's attachment and entry, genome replication, protein synthesis, assembly, and so forth. Now, this is an artificial division. We divide the cell, the infected cell, into steps so that it's easier for us to study it. But, of course, there are no such divisions in a real infected cell. We just do it to make it easier for us to study. Now, at the beginning here, we need to set forth some definitions. So the next slide has some of those definitions that you'll hear me use. These are words that you'll hear me use. You may not have heard any of them before, so you need to know what I'm talking about to understand. A susceptible cell. This has a very specific definition in virology. This is a cell that has a receptor for the virus. That's all that means. It has no other implications for the rest of the infectious cycle. All right, so if, if you hear someone say uh, you're susceptible to this virus, technically that's not correct because all susceptibility means is having a receptor for the virus. It has nothing to do with the rest of the re re replicative cycle. And of course, related to that is this idea about a resistant cell. A resistant cell doesn't have a receptor. It could be internally permissive for replication. For example, you, if you put the nucleic acid of the virus into the cell, which doesn't need a receptor, the nucleic acid may be able to initiate virus replication. So resistant only has to do with the presence or absence of a receptor. Then we move to permissive cells. A permissive cell has the capacity to replicate a virus. A permissive cell is one where if you put the nucleic acid of the virus inside of it, and we will talk about ways that we can do that experimentally, that nucleic acid will initiate an infectious cycle. So permissive is separate from susceptible. Susceptible has to do with the receptor. Permissive simply refers to what is going on inside of a cell. And finally, what cell can actually be infected with a virus and produce more virus particle? That would be a susceptible and permissive cell. Susceptible, the cell has receptors, and permissive means that the cell is able to support virus replication. So this is very specific for virology. And not everyone uses these terms correctly. Certainly the press doesn't, because they're always talking about being permissive or susceptible to infection. And all they mean is that a virus can infect you and produce more virus particles. But in, in our course, we're virologists explaining virology. Susceptible and permissive have very distinct meanings. And so for the rest of the course, when I use those terms, you should know exactly what I'm talking about. We couldn't always grow viruses in cells and culture because cell culture is a relatively recent development. Now, 60 years ago, that's, that's over half of the history of virology. But from the beginning, when viruses were first discovered uh, at the end of the 1800s, up until about 1950, we couldn't really study infection in cells. We had to use animals. And on this slide are pictured some of the different animals that have been used over the years to study virus infection. Now, this is very difficult to do, especially after the first few lectures of this course. You'll see you can't learn a lot by just studying an infection in an animal. You can put the virus in and watch the disease and learn a few things about the interaction of the virus with the host. But you can't learn the details of what happens in a single cell. 
And that's where you learn virology. So that, uh, to do that, we needed cell culture. Now, aside from animals, that are shown on this slide, the next slide shows you an embryonated chicken egg. So that's a fertilized chicken egg uh, that has a little embryo inside of it. Now, you go to the store and you buy eggs. They're not fertilized, of course, so they just have a yolk in them. Uh, but this is about a 10 or 12 day uh, post-fertilization chicken egg. And these were used to grow many viruses. On this slide, you can see that inoculating the virus in different places uh, in the embryonated chicken egg gives you different sorts, uh, susceptibility and permissivity to different kinds of viruses. For example, herpes simplex and pox viruses, you inoculate the chorioallantoic membrane, which is that membrane on the outside right below uh, the eggshell. Influenza virus is pretty much the only virus uh, w for which we use eggs to grow them up nowadays. In particular, allantoic inoculation. The allantoic fluid uh, is the fluid that's surrounding the embryo. Uh, and just around the embryo is the amniotic cavity and the amniotic fluid. The allantoic fluid is the larger volume around it, the, am the allantoic cavity. And you inject influenza virus into that, and it grows very well in the cells that are surrounding that cavity. So this has, again, been replaced for most viruses except influenza. In fact, most of the influenza vaccine that we use uh, in the U.S., is grown in embryonated chicken eggs. And the last slide, the, sorry, the next slide shows you a picture of a production facility where they are inoculating eggs with influenza viruses to make vaccine. Not all the flu vaccine is made in eggs. A good amount is made in cell culture. We're slowly moving to more and more cell culture, but it's harder than growing the virus in eggs. Growing flu in eggs is simple. You just drill a hole in the shell, you inject the virus in, you seal up the hole, you wait a few days, and then you harvest about six or eight mLs of uh, allantoic fluid, and that's full of virus. This procedure for making flu vaccine is, in, is completely automated. The inoculation, the incubation, the harvesting is all done by robotics. So it's very easy. And in fact, one egg gives about one dose of flu vaccine. So the next time you get a flu shot, if you get the shot, uh, that shot has about one egg's worth uh, of vaccine in it. But as I said, we're slowly moving away from this because lots of people have allergies to eggs, uh, chicken eggs or feathers and that sort, and they can't take the influenza vaccine. So we're moving towards growing flu virus in cells and also recombinant methods for making flu vaccine. So eventually this will be supplanted. The next slide is called Studying the Infectious cycle in cells. And as I say, this wasn't possible before 1949. We had to use animals. But in that year, three scientists uh, at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Enders, Weller, and Robbins, showed that it was possible to grow polioviruses in human cell cultures. They had taken embryonic tissues and minced them up and made single cell cultures of them and they showed that poliovirus actually grows in them and that was the first time that that was done. For this they got the Nobel Prize in 1954. Uh, John Enders got the cover of Time magazine. This was a big deal and this was what revolutionized virology. From that day we could use cells to grow viruses in and we could use cells to study the infectious cycle. The next slide shows you three different kinds of cell cultures that we use today. It's called virus cultivation. Uh, on the very left, you can see primary human cells. A primary cell is when you take a tissue and you chop it up and then digest it with trypsin, put it in a dish with medium on top. The cells will float to the bottom or sink to the bottom of the dish and they will form what we call a monolayer. And in these pictures, you can see a monolayer is simply nothing more than lots of cells growing together till they touch each other. Now, foreskin is a common tissue for making primary cells. Why is that? Because you can get lots of it every day. As male babies are born, they cut off their foreskins and throw them away. And if you're working at a medical center, you can go in and ask them for this. Now, nowadays, of course, you need a protocol and all kinds of paperwork to do it. In the old days, you could just walk in and say, hey, can I have some foreskins? And people would make that. <laughs> so it's a good use of foreskin. There are other tissues as well. But remember, uh, it's harder to get those because we like to keep our tissues for the most part. I guess most of you like to keep your tissues. Now, if you have surgery, the organs may often be discarded so you can uh, get some of those. And in fact, many cells we use today are derived from tissues discarded at surgery. In the middle, 
In fact, the last two panels on this cell are shown what we call cell lines. Now, a cell line means that the cells grow forever. They're immortal. Primary cells are not immortal. The cells will divide maybe 20 to 30 times, and then they will die. They've reached their so-called hayflick limit. Their telomeres have slowly degraded away, and the cells die. Cell lines are transformed. They live forever. They're usually, they're, they sort of are like cancer cells in a way, and we'll talk more about this later. They grow forever because they have aberrancies uh, in their mitotic regulation, so they just keep on dividing and dividing. And you can grow these in your lab forever. You just split them every few days when the cells are confluent, that is when they touch each other. So on this slide are, is shown a mouse cell line, and on the right, a human cell line, a very famous human cell line, the HeLa cell, which was made from a tumor taken from a woman, Henrietta Lacks, back in 1950 and has been growing in culture ever since. The HeLa cell was the first human cell line ever made. Before that, people had to make primary cell cultures, again, which didn't live forever. So this was a big deal, this HeLa cell line. So those are called continuous cell lines. The problem with them, of course, they're derived from tumors, usually. Or if you make them in vitro, there are ways to transform a cell in vitro so that it keeps growing and growing. They're different. They're not normal cell lines. That's why if you're really interested in virus infection in a normal cell, you have to use primary cells. Uh, the, the other, and along with being a tumor cell line, these cells are often really screwed up in the, in the number of chromosomes. They're usually aneuploid, which means they have all different numbers of chromosomes. And if that's a problem for your research, you can't use them as well. Now, there are some what we call diploid cell strains. All right, these are cells that live longer than primary cell lines. They have the right number of chromosomes. They're diploid, uh, but they don't live forever. They may live for 100 or 200 generations. The next slide is a picture of our cell culture incubator in our lab, just to show you that these cell lines and cell strains and primary cells are, are grown in a variety of, sub, of uh, containers, plastic dishes, uh, plates, six well plates, flasks of all sorts. This incubator, of course, is at 37 degrees centigrade, the body temperature of mammals, uh, and um, it's got 5% CO2 atmosphere, and that buffers the medium, so that as the viruses grow, or the cells grow, and the medium becomes acidified, it is buffered. The next slide shows a flask. It's called a spinner flask. This is another way that you can grow cells. So I showed you plastic dishes growing in an incubator, the cells in those are attached to the monolayer. But if you need a lot of cells, a real lot of cells, you grow them in a spinner. So there's a magnet in the middle, you can see in this picture, which spins. On, you place this on a magnetic stirrer plate, and the, the magnet spins and keeps the cells suspended. You can grow really, really dense cultures of this. The problem is not every cell line will grow in a spinner. This is, we use this in our laboratory. This happens to be HeLa cells. And HeLa cells, by the way, uh, are a controversial cell line because they were taken from Henrietta Lacks in 1950. And no one told the family. The woman they took them from died of a cervical tumor. And nobody told the family that researchers were using their mother's cells for years and years and years until the 70s. And then the family freaked out. And all of this is described in this wonderful, wonderful book by Rebecca Skloot. Uh, called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And uh, it's really a very nice description of the science and the family. She alternates chapters. Really nice. It's a really nice uh, history of this entire episode. Of course, nowadays when you take cells from people, you have to get a signed consent form. Back then you didn't have to do anything. Lots is different now. That's your first question. Should be up. A blank and blank cell is the only cell that can take up a virus particle and replicate it. Fill in the blanks. Naive and resistant, primary and permissive, susceptible and permissive, susceptible and naive, continuous and immortal. Which two describe the cell that can take up a particle and replicate it? It's an important concept for you to uh, understand. All right, 98% of you. Got C, susceptible and permissive. Right, those are the two terms. Susceptible, have a receptor. Permissive, be internally able to replicate 
the virus. The other terms are not things that I've mentioned today. But that's an important concept. I want you to remember that uh, because it really helps you uh, in understanding virology. So we have cells now that we can use to study virus infection. How do we use them? The first thing we have to deal with, how do you know your virus is infecting a cell when you infect it? How do you measure infection? One and very early way that was used is by looking at the infected cells and seeing them die as the virus replication proceeds. And this death is called cytopathic effect or CPE. So I'll often use that abbreviation, CPE, cytopathic effect. So it's illustrated here, top left, is a lovely monolayer. This happens to be a mouse cell line in which we have put the cellular receptor for poliovirus. So mouse cells don't have a receptor. So they are not what to virus and to poliovirus infection? They are not susceptible. Turns out, though, that mouse cells are permissive. So if you just put a receptor in them, now you can get them susceptible and permissive, and you can study uh, virus infection in them. So there's a monolayer of these cells. We infect them with poliovirus, and, and here is uh, two hours, four hours, and eight hours after infection. You can see the cells are starting to look different, even uh, at the early time point. You see in the upper left, the uninfected cells, a lovely monolayer. The cells are all flat, they're touching. And in the upper right, you see they're now rounded cells. So these are the cells that have detached and rounded up, and that's because the virus is killing them. And there are more of them on the lower left. They're all floating and rounded up, and eventually many of those break open. And you can see on the right lower panel, uh, there are not many intact cells left. So they break open as the virus comes out. So that's one example of what we call cytopathic effect. There are many different kinds of cytopathic effects depending on the virus. So Typically, we work with a particular virus in our laboratories. We get to know uh, what the cytopathic effects are like. Another kind of cytopathic effect is shown in this slide. It's, it's called the formation of syncytia. All right, syncytia is, is, a, is a plural. Syncytium would be the singular. All that means is many cells fused together. All the cells fuse so that you have one cell with many nuclei. So on the left is a photograph of infected cells. Not every virus does this. Typically the ones that have uh, envelopes and infect cells by fusion. We'll talk more about that later. You can see in this picture there are lots of single cells, but here on the left shown by an arrow is a syncytium. It's one giant cell with many nuclei. So that's the results of, of many cells that were infected fusing with each other. And here on the right is shown this in a schematic. We have two uh, cells that are infected, one of them is infected. It's displaying on its surface a viral protein that is usually used by the virus to fuse with the cell. So because it's on the cell, the whole cell is fusing with a neighbor. So now you have a cell with two nuclei and that will go on to fuse with other cells to get multi-nuclei cells. And in some infections, if you see this, uh, you can tell almost immediately what the infection is. So for example, people with measles, uh, they have characteristic lesions in the mouth. You can take a little scraping of those lesions and look under a microscope and see these syncytium. It's almost diagnostic for measles infection. This is a list of some of the different kinds of cytopathic effects. I want you to know what a cytopathic effect is. You don't need to know the different kinds. You simply need to know that a cytopathic effect is an alteration in the morphology of a cell. Uh, that is characteristic, that's caused by virus replication. I'm showing you this because you can see all these different viruses which you haven't encountered yet, but these are both DNA and RNA viruses with or without envelopes, have different sorts of syncytia. Uh, and w we've talked about syncytium, I'm sorry, cytopathic effects. We've talked about syncytium formation, uh, cell fusion. We also talked about rounding up and detachment of cultured cells and so forth. And so all of this is a consequence of virus replication. The virus makes gene products that are causing the cells to have these alterations. All right, so that's how you can just look at an infected cell. But not every virus causes cytopathic effects. Many of them ha cause nothing visible in an infected cell. They can actually make virus particles. The cells look pretty normal. And they can get out without killing the cell. So how would we know that the, the cells are infected. Well, we have to be able to measure the virus particle in some way. We can ask how many viruses are in a sample. If we have an infected cell culture, we can take the supernatant and ask how many viruses are there. And there are two ways we can measure that. We can measure infectivity or 
if we don't have an assay for infectivity, we can measure the number of physical particles that are present in a cell. My favorite is the plaque assay. This is the most beautiful assay in all of virology. It was first developed in the 1930s to study bacteriophages. Bacteriophages were the first to be quantitatively studied. Here we have a monolayer of uh, bacteria growing on a petri dish as an auger substratum. And wherever a virus has infected a bacterium, it's made a number of progeny until you can see uh, a clearing in the monolayer, which is a plaque. So the plaque is a basically killing of the bacterial cells. So instead of seeing the cloudy background, you see a clear uh, spot. So that is what a plaque is. This was adopted to study animal viruses by Renato Dubecco in 1952. He was an Italian virologist uh, who worked uh, at the Salk Institute. And for this and other work, he got the Nobel Prize in 1975. On the upper left was his first plaque assay that he published uh, in 1952. It was uh, an animal virus. Here's the, the name of the paper. Production of plaques in a monolayer tissue cultured by single particles of an animal virus. So 1952 is only a couple of years after HeLa cells and the fact that Enders showed you can in fact uh, cells and culture with the virus. Anyway, this, this Italian virologist took advantage of this and it propelled his and other uh, uh, careers forward. So how does a plaque assay work? What you do is you take your virus stock. This can be something you got from a colleague. You may have infected cells and you want to know how much virus is in the supernate. You take that and you make dilutions. That's all these tubes are here. You make tenfold dilutions. You put 0.9 mLs of, of medium into each tube and then you take, a point, you take 0.1 mL from the virus stock, you put it in the first tube, mix it up, and then you take another 0.1 mL, put it in the next tube, and you mix it up and you go all the way down the line. So these are tenfold serial dilutions. You then take some of the higher dilutions and put 0.1 mLs uh, onto a monolayer of cells. You cover them with an auger overlay that restricts the movement of virus. And that way when a virus infects a single cell and it's that cell makes more virus particles, those viruses will only infect the surrounding cell, so eventually you'll get the formation of a plaque, which is basically killing uh, of the cells. Then you can count the number of plaques. Here is a good plate for us to count because it has a countable number. Typically between 10 and 100 or so is countable. We have 17 plaques, and if you take into considering the dilution, which is 10 to the minus 6, plus another tenfold dilution, we, point, we played out only 0.1 mLs, it's 1.7 times 10 to the eighth plaque forming units per mil. So that's how we can use a, a plaque assay to measure how many viruses we have. Now here are some photographs to illustrate further the idea of a plaque assay. So again, on top is a plate of cells in which we've infected with one of our virus dilutions. And the idea is what happens, uh, the virus infects a single cell and kills it or lyses it. And you show that in the first circle here, the virus produced by that first infected cell will then go on and infect surrounding cells. And it is restricted to the surrounding cells because of the auger overlay. If you had a liquid overlay on this plate, the viruses would spread throughout the culture and infect every cell. You couldn't quantitate plaque forming units. And that uh, opening, that clearing of cells gets bigger and bigger until you can see it. And the, how long it takes depends on the virus for polio, just two days, you get a very nice plaque. Now on the lower left, is a microscopic examination of a single plaque. And you can see the intact monolayer around the clearing. And there are lots of dead and detached cells here. When you stain this and take off the overlay, then those cells go away and you have a clearing. On the right is a kind of plaque assay uh, using a virus that doesn't actually form a plaque. So what we've done here is we've put a gene encoding an enzyme uh, into this virus. And then we add a substrate which turns blue wherever the virus is replicating. So you can see a very nice plaque uh, there, which you couldn't see by cell killing, but you can see by staining with this particular dye. So here's a movie of a plaque formation. This was done in a laboratory in the UK. They took uh, cells and infected them with vaccinia virus. They identified a single uh, focus of infected cells at the beginning right there. They put the camera on it and did time lapse photography. So this is something like 12, 14, 15 hours total reduced to a few seconds. So what you can see is the cells are dying in the plaque. The plaque mar margin is moving outwards. The cells in the middle are dead uh, and eventually the plaque fills the screen. That's actually how a plaque forms in real time. 
It's like you drop a pebble into a pond and the ripple goes out. You put a virus in the middle cell, and as it releases viruses, they, surround, they infect surrounding cells, and that moves out in a circle uh, more and more. This really illustrates nicely how a plaque assay works. Now, my lab, we do lots of plaque assays. Uh, and uh, we do a lot of them in these six well plates. Many years ago, a postdoc of mine had done a huge experiment, like a thousand plates. And I said to her, why don't you build a wall? So she built the wall in the lab. We called it the wall of polio. And um, I don't know if you can see the sign, but that's, you know, that's from the Pink Floyd album, the wall. But the one in the lab kept collapsing because they were just standing there. So I rebuilt it in my office. These are all glued together with crazy glue against the wall. And it almost reaches the ceiling. And um, when people visit, I take their pictures. In front of this, I have a website where I have all their pictures. Many, many famous people have come. And of course, when you visit for office hours, you're welcome to have your picture taken in front. So you too can be immortal, immortalized. All right, so it is time for another question. This one, when doing a plaque assay, what is the purpose of adding a semi-solid agar overlay on the monolayer of infected cells to stabilize progeny virions, to ensure that the cells remain susceptible and permissive, to act as a pH indicator, to keep cells adherent to the plate during incubation, or to restrict viral diffusion, after lysis of infected cells. All right, well, most of you got E, which is to restrict viral diffusion after lysis of infected cells. That's the purpose of the other overlay. It is not to keep the cells on the plate. They would stay there anyway, unless they were killed, of course. But if, they're not, if there's no agar overlay, if it were a liquid, which is the only alternative to having an, a, a solid overlay, viruses would diffuse throughout the culture, kill every cell, and you wouldn't be able to quantify the foci of infection. Remember, each plaque arises from a single infectious unit. I'm telling you that that's true. I haven't shown you why yet, but I will in a moment. So you need an agar overlay to restrict the diffusion so you actually get a plaque. So here is what a plaque assay looks like. These are influenza virus plaques. And you can see there's a tenfold se dilution series here going from a lot of plaques to fewer and then just one or none on the last series. So there's your plaque. This is the one I would count right here in the middle. This is too many. They start to overlap and you really can't tell how many plaques there are here. They're all pretty well isolated. This is one is not, is not enough to give you statistical robustness. So the next question is something I alluded to. How do you know that you only need one virus to form a plaque? Maybe you need more. So how many viruses are needed to form a plaque? This is a very easy question to answer with any virus that forms plaque. You do what's called a dose response assay. A dose response assay is a general name for an, an experiment where you add more and more of something and you see what happens. In this case, we add more and more virus to a plate of cells and we see how many plaques we get. So on the x-axis here, we have more and more virus. This is concentration of virus, but it's going up, as you can see. And on the y-axis, we have the number of plaques. And very early on, in fact, in Dubeco's first paper, he did this experiment to show that when you do this experiment, you get a straight line. And the straight line means that you have one hit, that one virus is enough to initiate a plaque. So for most viruses, this is the case. It's not true for all viruses. For some viruses, you need two particles to form a plaque. And when you do the experiment, you get a curved line such as that. So that's two hit kinetics. The number of plaques is directly proportional to the square of the concentration. Whereas in one hit kinetics, uh, the number of plaques is proportional to the first power of the concentration of virus inoculated. It's very simple. You double the virus, you double the number of plaques. So you need, for many viruses, one virus to initiate a plaque. All right, so for most of the viruses we're going to talk about, one virus particle is enough to make a plaque. Are you curious about why you would need two? Good, I hope so. You should be curious. Mm -hmm. That is what makes virology and science so interesting. For viruses where you need two, it turns out that the genome is split between two particles. It's not all in one particle. So most of the viruses we'll talk about uh, t in this course, the genome is put in one particle, or each particle contains a complete genome. 
but for some it's split into two and a lot of plant viruses are like that you have to get two viruses to infect a cell and it works it's a evolutionarily sustainable approach because it's still there now we use plaque assays to make clonal virus stocks this is called plaque purification you simply do a plaque assay as shown here and you can take a plastic pipette and you plunge it into the auger above the plaque. So you have to be able to see the plaque without staining it. We often stain them to make it easier to count, but if you're gonna pick a plaque, you can't stain it because that will kill or that will neutralize the infectivity of the virus. So here uh, you can plunge a plastic pipette into the auger. You get a little bit of the auger and that has some virus in it. You put that into some buffer uh, and then you can infect cells with it. And we do this three times and we, we get what we call clonal stocks. Now, the, why do we do this? Well, typically when you, uh, when, you, when you make a mutant in the laboratory or if you get a clinical isolate, you want to have pure stocks and so you do this to make sure that there aren't um, mixtures in the stock that you're getting. And we do it three times just to ensure that there, aren't, uh, there isn't a second plaque hiding in that first one because they could overlap. So sometimes uh, a cell can be infected with two viruses or two cells very close by can be infected with two different viruses. It would give you two plaques but you, couldn't be able, you wouldn't be able to distinguish them. Now, if you can't do a plaque assay, there are other ways you can assay infectivity, and one of those ways is shown on this side. This is called an endpoint dilution assay. It's a lot harder than a plaque assay, much more work, but basically uh, these are for viruses where you can't form a plaque for whatever reason. What you do is, again, you make dilutions of your virus stock just in a plaque assay, and then you infect uh, plates of cells. In this format, we're using a 96-well plate because higher numbers give us greater reproducibility. So here we have a row of wells, each of which is a, contains a monolayer of cells. And we infect all of them with a 10 to the minus 2 dilution. And the next row we infect with a minus 3 and a minus 4, etc. You then incubate these cells. You do it under a liquid overlay, and you wait for the cells to show cytopathic effects. And then you end the assay and score it. So here on the bottom is the scoring of our assay. We're looking for cytopathic effects, plus or minus. So some of the wells at the higher dilutions, you'll see have no cytopathic effect because they didn't receive any viruses at that dilution. Then as you move down into the lower dilutions, you can see there's a mix of plus and minuses, whereas at the lowest dilution, all the wells have CPE because they all got virus. What you do is you pick the dilution at which half of the wells are positive, and we call that the tissue culture infectious dose 50. And in this uh, assay, it falls on this dilution, I believe, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Five pluses and five minuses. You think in real life it always falls on a dilution? No, science is never that nice to you. It usually falls in between two dilutions. Then you have to use a formula to extrapolate and you get something like, instead of here, you would have 10 to the five TCID50s. You could have 10 to the 5.5 or 10 to the 4.5, okay? But it is a measurable, uh, character of the virus, the amount of virus that will kill half of the cultures. You can do the same thing with animals. You could ask, uh, what's the amount of virus to cause disease or to kill half of the animals that we inoculate? We'll come back to this later as well. Now, when we're talking about plaque assays, another issue that crops up is what we call the particle to PFU ratio. And boiled down to a simple question, it is, is every virus in this tube that I have able to form a plaque? And the answer is, for most viruses, no. For most viruses, there are way more particles in the tube than, you, than can form a plaque. All right? The, number, the particle to PFU ratio is, is a numeric way that we quantify this property. And all it is is the number of physical particles divided by the number of infectious particles determined by a plaque assay. So we know that a single particle can cause a plaque. I've shown you that before by the dose response curve. However, not every virus can do that. Some viruses do not initiate plaque formation. And that's because they may be damaged, uh, they may have mutations in the genome, or it simply may be that, you know, to replicate th throughout an infectious cycle, the virus has to go through many steps, attachment, uncoding, uh, synthesis of genomes, synthesis of proteins, et cetera. And if it fails at any one point for whatever reason, that's the end of the cycle, all right? So this is why there are way more 
particles than infectious units or PFU in most virus stocks. Makes it hard to study virology because, to study viruses, because when you do an assay, you don't know if what you're seeing is actually the result of the infectious or non-infectious particles. So here's a table showing you some ratios for different animal viruses. So I look at this virus on the top. These are papillomaviruses, uh, which, which uh, we'll talk about later, that cause warts. 10,000 particle to PFU ratio. That means out of 10,000 particles in a preparation of this virus, only one can form a plaque. The rest are defective for some reason. Not all viruses are that bad. This one down here, some leaky forest viruses, one or two, that's pretty good. Uh, and many other viruses are in between. Influenza viruses, for example, shown here. Uh, Picorna viruses, 30 to 1,000 and so forth. So again, this is an important parameter to remember when you're studying viruses, that not every particle does form a plaque. It's, in theory, capable of forming a plaque, a single particle, but uh, many of them do not. And the property known as particle to PFU ratio. Particle can best be described as one of the proteins that makes up the virion, one, a virus which may or may not be infectious, a virus which is infectious, a virus which is not infectious, elementary or composite. 79% of you picked B, a virus which may or may not be infectious. Exactly, that's what we mean by a particle. Because the particle, we're assaying what the particle to PFU ratio is, that particle could be infectious or not. And if it's infectious, then the P particle to PFU ratio is closer to one. If it's not infectious, then it's higher than one. And the other answer is one of the proteins which makes up the virion, that's not correct, a virus which is infectious, the particle can be infectious or not infectious. The infectivity is under the denominator of that equation, the PFU. A virus which is not infectious, uh, it's, it's not just what a particle is. An elementary composite, I'm glad none of you got that. That's from physics. Now, let's go on with more ways to use the infectious cycle. An important tool that we use is called the one-step growth cycle. This was developed by two physicists. This is why I stuck a physics reference in that last question, because early in the uh, life of the evolution of virology in the 1930s and 40s, many physicists decided to become virologists, and they were studying bacteriophages, because they thought that studying bacteriophages could be quant a quantitative way to study the gene, and they were very interested in that. And these, Max Delbruck was a physicist who came over and revolutionized virology. He developed a plaque assay, a one-step growth curve, excuse me, using bacteriophages. So what you do is you take E. coli cells and you absorb the virus. You simply add virus to the cells. We call that adsorption because they're sticking to the surface. You then dilute the culture and that prevents further absorption. So we're synchronizing the culture, the infection. You then allow the infection to proceed and you take samples at different time points and you measure them by a plaque assay. So you can very readily do plaque assays with bacteriophages. And so on the left is the result of some of these early one-step growth curves. You can see why we call them that. We're looking at time after infection with the number of infectious particles. So here, you dilute the culture and the infection starts. You have quite a bit of time where there's no new virus produced. You do a plaque assay on these supernatants and there's no virus. We call that the eclipse period. Now what's going on in the eclipse period? The virus has put its genomic material into the cell and new proteins are being made to make new virus particles. So it takes time to do that. Then all of a sudden, at some point, you have the production of infectious particles uh, and then the infection ends, in this case, when the cells are all lysed and they can't produce any more virus. So the, the virus produced is called the burst or the yield because in the early experiments, they were surprised to see all of a sudden this release of virus over time. Now that is a experiment where all the cells are infected. We'll, we'll talk in a moment about how you would know that. On the right is the same kind of experiment when we've made dilutions of the inoculum, the virus inoculum, so that not every cell is infected at the onset. So again, you have an eclipse period, you have your first burst of virus, and then those go on to infect all of the uninfected cells, and then you have a second burst. On the left is a one-step growth curve. I think you can see why it's called that. Every cell is infected, and they all go through the infectious cycle at the same time. They're synchronized, and they all release virus at once. You get one burst of virus, whereas if you dilute the culture, you, you don't initially infect all the cells, 
So those yes. first, bless you, those first infected cells are, in, are releasing virus that then goes on to infect the uninfected cells in the culture. Now you want to do it one step because that's easy to study what's going on in these cells. You get a better signal. In the old days when people were labeling nucleic acids and proteins of viruses, they wanted every cell infected so they could get a good signal in their experiments. Um, and that's why one step growth curve was so important. Now, subsequently, of course, this was developed for animal viruses that infect mammalian cells in culture or, or insect cells in culture. And it's the same kind of experiment. You infect cells. Uh, in this case, we've infected them so that all the cells are infected. Uh, we then, and we, in animal cells, we keep them at low temperature on ice so that the viruses bind, but they do not get into the cell. Then at some point, usually an hour after adsorption, we warm up the cultures, the viruses start their infection. And then we measure virus uh, released by the cells by, P, by a plaque assay shown here on the y-axis. And again, on the x-axis, we have hours after adsorption. That's the time when we've warmed up the cells. And again, you see an eclipse period here. And then at about 12 hours, uh, you can measure uh, viruses being produced. But these two curves uh, in red and blue, these are intracellular viruses. We break open the cells and we measure what is being produced inside of the cell. If you measure what's being released from the cell, that's the extracellular virus, you get a little bit of a different picture. You don't see that virus until 16 hours after adsorption. All right, so there is a difference between viruses made in the cell and out. Of course, it makes sense, right? They're made in the cell, and then the cell has to break for them to get out, and apparently uh, there is a four-hour lag when, between when a virus is made in a cell and between the time you see it outside of the cell. And so we now have another period that describes that, the latent period. The latent period is a time until we start to see extracellular viruses. So the eclipse period is when we see any viruses at all within the cell, and the latent period is the time until we see viruses released from the cell. So that's a one-step growth curve. And again, I want to remind you of how it differs from the way bacteria grow. We talked about this last time. Bacteria grow by binary fission. You put a single bacterium in a broth and it immediately begins to divide, and you can see bacterial growth if you measure time versus cell number. There's no eclipse. There's no latent period because these cells are simply dividing. Again, the eclipse period for virus infection is because the viruses need to make the parts inside the cell to make new viruses. Now, when we do these one-step growth curves, one of the key properties is that we have to make sure that every cell is infected. Right? So they all go through the cycle at once, and we get that very nice single burst. If we don't infect every cell, we're going to get multiple bursts. And that's not what we want. We want a single cycle. So how do we know that all the cells are infected? You have to know somehow beforehand, right? Otherwise, you won't be able to do the experiment. So here's how you know. It's called multiplicity of infection. Multiplicity of infection, or MOI, another one of these abbreviations I will use, is very simple. It's the number of infectious particles, viruses, the number of infectious vi viruses added per cell. It is not the number of particles that each cell receives. Very important difference. It's the number of particles you add. So for example, if you add 10 to the seventh plaque forming units to a million cells, the multiplicity of infection is 10. But it does not mean that every cell gets 10 particles. So I think there are 110 of you in here. If I had a big bucket of 110 tennis balls and was able to randomly throw it out to you, some of you would get none, some of you would get one, lucky ones would get two or three. The same kind of random events govern virus infection of cells. So that's why we need a statistical equation to describe how many cells, how many viruses infect a cell when we add viruses at a certain MOI. And the infection is described by the Poisson distribution. And this is basically because infection is a random process. When we mix susceptible cells that have a receptor uh, with virus, some are uninfected, some get one, two, three or more particles, just like the tennis balls that I've thrown to you. And that distribution, the number of tennis balls you get, the number of virus particles that infect every cell is the Poisson distribution. It is a distribution that describes low frequency events in such experiments. 
So there it is at the top, pk equals e to the minus m, mk over k factorial, uh, where pk is the fraction of cells infected by k virus particles, and m is the multiplicity of infection. That is an experimental parameter. That's how many viruses you add per cell. Remember, always remember the MOI is what you are adding. And using this equation, we can determine depending on how many virus particles we add, how many get zero, one, or more virus particles. So for example, uninfected cells can be described, which is P0, can be described simply by E to the minus M, the natural log to the minus M, M again being MOI, the number of particles you add. Cells receiving one particle is ME to the minus M. You can simply substitute one into that equation and you can see how many cells get one particle, or whatever the multiplicity may be. M could be one, five, 10, whatever, and if you substitute it in, you'll get the number of cells receiving one particle. And then you, if you want to know the cells that are multiply infected, they get more than one, it's one minus e to the minus m times m plus one. And that is basically subtracting from one. One is the sum of all probabilities for any value of k, uh, the sum of the probabilities p0 and p1. So you take away p0, uninfected, p1, the ones that get one, and then what's left is the ones that get more than one. All right, so this is a relatively straightforward concept. Here are a couple of examples uh, just to make sure you understand. Uh, if you take a million cells, you infect them at an MOI of 10. So you're adding 10 to the seventh PFU. That's what an MOI of 10 means. You put 10 to the seventh PFU in a culture of a million cells. 45 cells are uninfected, 40, 450 get one particle, and the rest get more than one. So basically, this, is entirely, this culture is entirely infected. And if you did an MOI of 10, you'd have a lovely one-step growth curve because they'd all be infected and they'd all proceed through the replicative cycle together. If you do an MOI of 1, all right, now you're adding 10 to the 6 PFU to a million cells. 37% of the cells are uninfected. 37% get one particle and 26% get more than one. So a third of the cells remain uninfected. You're not going to get such a nice one step. You're going to get a two-step growth curve with this. If you do an MOI of 0 0.001, very low MOI, you can see most of the cells are uninfected and very few uh, get any viruses at all. But some of them will get, uh, 990 cells will get one particle. And so if you're interested in studying multi-cycle growth curves, this is the way to do it. Now often you may make a virus mutant and you do a one-step growth curve and there's no defect. But if you did a multi-step growth curve, the small defect would be amplified over each cycle. So doing a low MOI infection be, would be the way to go there. All right. So that's multiplicity of infection. That's how you figure out what fraction of your cells are going to be infected. If cells are infected in an MOI of 10 in a one-step growth cycle experiment, in the growth curve, you will likely see multiple bursts of virus release, multiple eclipse periods, a single burst of virus release, no burst of virus release, or asynchronous infection. C, 90% of you got C, single birth of virus release. The others are wrong. Most, most 10%, 9% of you said multiple bursts. But remember from the slide I showed you, I'll put it back up. If you do an MOI of 10, very few cells are uninfected, only 45 in the culture. The rest are getting one or more than one particle, so they're all infected. So you're going to have a single growth curve. You'll never see those 45 cells uh, making viruses, because most of the culture will die. Now maybe you were thinking, ah, those 45 cells remain to be infected, but you would never see the yield of virus from those cells in a one-step growth curve. All right, there are other ways to measure viruses besides infectivity that we've talked about. Let's go through some of these. These are called physical measurements. They include uh, hemagglutination. You can just look at the number of particles by electron microscopy. That's a bit laborious. You don't really do that to measure virus particles unless you're working with a new virus. You can measure viral enzymes. Some virus particles have enzymes in them that you can assay. You can do serology. You can use antibodies to measure the components of virus particles. And you can look for viral nucleic acids. We have lots of great technologies to do that. Let's go through a couple of these. Hemagglutination was one of the first methods for quantifying uh, viruses. It's typically done for influenza virus, but there are other viruses that hemagglutinate as well. The way this works is that some viruses attach to receptors on cells, which also happen to be 
on the surface of red blood cells. And these are typically sialic acids, which are sugars, single sugars that are present on glycoproteins. Many viruses bind to those to get into cells. Red blood cells have them. So if you mix uh, red blood cells with dilutions of virus, you can get uh, hemagglutinations. What happened is the, the red blood cell will bind the virus, and then you'll have multiple viruses bound on the surface, and that virus will then bind to another red blood cell uh, and another and so forth. And that's called hemagglutination. Hem a positive hemagglutination is shown in the lower row here uh, when the red blood cells form a film on the bottom of these wells. If there's no virus present, all the red blood cells tumble down to the bottom of the well. They form a nice little button or dot here you can see in the top row. Uh, and in the bottom row you can see there is hemagglutination. So the top, these are two samples of viruses. Dilutions were made. You can see 1 to 4, 1 to 8, 16, etc. Uh, and they're mixed with red blood cells. They're put in these wells and they're allowed to incubate. You can see the top sample doesn't have any virus in it according to the hemagglutination assay, whereas the bottom one hemagglutinates uh, out until about uh, 1 to 1024 dilution. So we would see, we would say that this virus, uh, I would say that the, the, the HA titer is 512 actually, because that's the last uh, dilution at which you see hemagglutination. It's a good way to measure the amount of influenza virus very quickly. With, you can also do plaque assays for this virus, but this takes 30 minutes. So if you want to know rapidly, this is the way to go. Measuring viral enzymes. There's a family of viruses called retroviruses that we'll talk about a lot. They have inside the particle an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. It will take an RNA template and make DNA out of it. It's very easy to measure this enzyme in particles. Uh, you simply break open the virus particles and add some substrates and they will be incorporated. And the, such an assay is shown here. Uh, this is the, what we've done here is we've taken the supernatant of three different cell lines, either mock infected or infected with a retrovirus called XMRV. And at different days after infection, we take a little bit of the supernatant, which may or may not have virus in it. We do the reverse transcriptase assay. We break open the virus particles. We add some uh, magnesium. We add deoxy NTPs, one of which is radioactively labeled. We let it incubate. And then we filter it through a paper that will retain any uh, product that's made. And you can see uh, that, these, that the LN cap cells make virus. These are simply two different dilutions. Uh, the DU145 cells don't make any virus, whereas the, uh, the WIMPY cells uh, make a little bit of virus, but they live up to their name. They don't make a lot. They make less than XMRV. So that's just one example of using uh, measuring enzyme activity. We'll, we'll talk about such assays throughout this course. Another assay involves serology. This is extensively used throughout virology and epidemiology to see if people have been infected at some point in their lives, whether they have antibodies to the virus or whether they have the virus itself. So these assays, you can use antibodies to either measure virus particles or proteins, or you can measure antibodies against the virus. So here on the left, we are looking for viral antigens. We take a capture antibody. All that is is an antibody that we have against the virus or a virus protein. We attach it to a plastic support, typically a 96 well plate. We then add a, a sample that we think has virus in it. So maybe you're doing diagnostics. You want to see if someone's infected. If there are viral proteins in it, they will bind to the antigen. Then you use a second antibody to that viral protein, which now has some kind of an indicator a fluorescent indicator or an enzyme so that you can see it readily and you can detect the viral antigen. All right, so that's detecting viral antigens. Uh, on the right, we're looking for antibodies against the virus. So let's say you're interested in seeing how many people in the U.S. have been infected with Zika virus. This is a now a virus that is exploding just as we've started this course, so you can understand everything about it, well, as, whereas everyone else is in the dark. Big outbreak in Brazil associated with perhaps microcephaly, birth defects. So let's say you want to see how many people in the US have had this infection. You take serum samples uh, and then you would take some viral antigen, some Zika virus antigen, attach it to a plastic surface. You would then add the serum samples of people you want to know if they're infected. If they have antibodies to the virus, and they would have it if they've been previously infected, the antibody will bind the antigen, and then you can detect the bound antibody by using a second anti-IgG that has an indicator. Very powerful methods for looking at the patterns of virus infection. We'll come back to these much later.
these assays have been adapted to rapid formats that can be used in physician offices. This is called a dipstick assay. It can be done in 30 minutes. You buy these, uh, these are basically slides on, that are coated with a variety of reagents. Here they have antibodies to whatever antigen you're looking for together with a control antibody. The physician takes a clinical sample. It can be urine, it can be blood, it can be respiratory secretions. You put it on the end of the pad, the liquid wicks up carrying with it the antibodies. And then at this end of the pad are attached other antibodies. The first line is a test line that will capture some of the antigen, some of the antibodies that are present just as a positive control. And then if antibodies uh, are present to your, um, if, if antigens are present, they will react with the antibodies on the second line and you'll get a positive line, a blue line or a black line forming. So a very rapid way to do this. Now, these aren't terribly accurate, but they are good for a first line uh, diagnosis. We can also measure viruses by incorporating genes into their genomes that make colors. Here's an example using green fluorescent protein. I mention it because, of course, here Marty Chalfie was the first to show that you could take this GFP gene, which is found in jellyfish, and put it into an organism. He used C. elegans, and for that, of course, he got the Nobel Prize. But now you can put it into any organism you want, including viruses. And here is an example of an experiment where uh, herpes viruses were engineered to put in several different kinds of fluorescent proteins. So since the isolation of GFP, we've been able to find other colors as well as modify these proteins so that they are red and yellow and cyan and so forth. So here is an example of multicolor virus infection. And here you can ask the question, if you infect a cell with seven different or eight different colored viruses, how many actually get into the cell? So lots of uses for green viruses. Here's another example where a herpes virus was made containing the GFP gene. And here is a neuron infected with that virus. You can see the, the cell body, the neuron, and the axons and dendrites are all full of GFP. And on the right is an experiment where we're using HIV that produces a, a, a green fluorescent protein. These are HIV particles shown here in green. We can see these particles under light microscopy because the light amplifies the size of the particle and also because we have super high resolution microscopy now that allows this to be done. And you can actually see uh, the viruses. In this case, they're attaching to the microtubule network of the cell and moving uh, into the cell. Really interesting real-time experiments. You can watch viruses moving into and about cells. We have many ways to look at the nucleic acids of viruses, including polymerase chain reaction. This is used for research. In our labs, we use PCR. We use it in industry to make products. And of course, we use it to diagnose infections, not only by viruses, but bacteria and fungi and so forth. It's just a brilliant method. You start with a double-stranded DNA. You denature it. You raise the temperature. Now you have two strands. You anneal a primer. And then you add a polymerase that will copy the strands. So you go from two to four strands. You repeat that. You denature. You add your enzyme and you get from uh, 4 to 8 and 8 to 16, so you get exponential growth. So you can go from a very small amount of DNA or RNA to a lot that you can then detect. We'll be using this a lot in this course to talk about experiments and diagnostics. I want to point out that you do multi-cycles of heating at 95 degrees and then incubating at a lower temperature so that the enzyme will work. You need an enzyme that can stand 95 degrees. The reason this technique was developed was because back in 1968, a microbiologist named Tom Brock was exploring the hot springs of Yellowstone Park. There were bacteria growing in it. He wanted to know what they were. And eventually, the DNA polymerase from one of those bacteria, Thermus aquaticus, and that was the first enzyme used for this TAC polymerase, was shown to be thermostable. Of course, it's living at 95 degrees in these hot springs. Tom Brock had no idea what his discovery was leading to. This is called the serendipity of science. This is why the best science, you let scientists pursue their curiosity and good things will always happen. We do a lot of high, deep high throughput sequencing these days. It used to be, in the old days, you would do many reactions and run them out on gels. This is not deep high throughput sequencing. Now it's all automated. Uh, you can do lots and lots of sequences in a very short period of time. We call this metagenomics. You can get 
environmental samples and sequence all the nucleic acids in them. You can get people who are sick that don't have any known pathogens and sequence their blood or tissues and you can find new pathogens. And we'll talk about this quite a bit in this course. The human genome, a number of years ago, was sequenced. It took 10 years using the old technology, running these gels. It cost $3 billion, 10 years. You can do a genome today in a day, and it costs you $1,500. Technology is rapidly advances, advancing, and this propels virology forward as well. And here are two examples of cool new viruses that were identified by deep sequencing. So here on the top, and these are two episodes of my podcast on the top, a virus that causes a disease of snakes. This was done by John, Joe DeRisi out at UCSF. One of, somebody just wrote to him one day and said, my snake is sick, and sent him a picture. This woman sent him a picture of her with the snake around her neck. So he got intrigued. It turned out this was a well-known disease of snakes. He got some samples. He sequenced them. He found a new virus. And at the bottom, uh, a new tick-borne viral disease identified in several farmers in the Midwest. Farmers came in. They were sick, eventually they died. They had been bitten by ticks, took some blood from these farmers, they deep sequenced it and found a new virus. It's an incredible, exciting technology which is driving the field forward. But I wanna leave you with a little caution. Here is a story published in PLOS, uh, PLOS One a number of years ago. Zoonotic viruses associated with illegally imported wildlife products. Turns out that many people like to bring animal pieces into the country from other countries with them, including skulls and legs from monkeys mainly, but other things as well. They're dried and they put them in their suitcase. And of course, they're picked up at JFK and they're confiscated. And these are some of the stuff that's confiscated. Well, uh, Ian Lipkin, a colleague of mine at Columbia, took some of these. He collected them from the Immigration Service and he extracted nucleic acids and did deep sequencing and found viral sequences in them. And here on the right is a letter as a article in the New York Times based on that article, from the jungle to JFK, viruses cross borders in monkey meat. So these viruses were picked up by deep sequencing. There was actually no complete genome sequence in any of these samples, but even if there were, it's a DNA sequence. It is not a virus. How is the only way you would know that there is a virus in these samples? you'd have to show that it's infectious. Otherwise, it's just fragments of DNA. It's not viruses. So this is obviously lost on the New York Times writer. They're not viruses. I would have called this fragments of viral DNA across the border. Now, understandably, this is much less interesting than viruses, right? But you should not bend the truth in order to make an exciting story. So if any of you ever write, if any of you ever write one day, either for the Times or any science outlet, remember, a DNA sequence does not prove that you have a virus. A virus is an infectious entity. If you're just picking up DNA, that's what you've got, uh, not viruses. All right, see you next time. <laughs>